So I'm excited to talk about RxJS today. Uh, how many of y'all are Angular developers? Angular, lots of folks. What about React? Vue, not as many folks. OK. Um, of the folks who are React developers, who's using Redux Observable? A few folks. Cool. Awesome. Well, today I'm going to talk about operators in RxJS, actually. And um, the reason why I put this talk together is because this is something that a lot of people wonder about. And I feel bad that my talk is actually more complete than the documentation right now. So I'm doing a very bad job at <laughs> updating the docs for this. Um, but today you can kind of think of this talk as a dictionary for all the operators that you actually care about, because there's just too many to consider, right? So we're going to go through, this talk is going to go through a, f a bunch of real world use cases and gotchas for quite a few. But I wanted to introduce myself first. If I can get my thing to work, let's see. Ah, there you go. So my name is Tracy. I am the CEO of a company called This.Labs. We started the company off with uh, a bunch of core contributors of different frameworks and libraries. I'm on the RxJS core team. Ben Lesh is one of my co-founders. He wrote RxJS um, and was most recently on the Angular core team. Uh, I do Rx workshop trainings with Ben as well. We're going to start it back up in 2020. I'm a Google developer expert for Angular and the web, also a Microsoft MVP, and I do a lot of stuff for the community. So if you want to talk about anything related to JavaScript, I'm always happy to chat. So I want to just first talk about the anatomy of an operator so you can understand what operators are actually doing under the hood. So the very basic explanation of what an operator is is just something that helps you transform one observable into another. So here is what it would look like to use operators in your code. All we're doing here is simply creating an observable of numbers. And then I'm just using the map and filter operators to subscribe to the observable with the observer and then emit the values from that observable and log it out in the console, right? Pretty basic. But if you want to look under the hood, right, this is an actual, just a very simple map operator implementation if you were to create it for yourself. So what you'll see here is that we're simply taking an observable and we're returning a new observable. And then what we're doing is we're subscribing to it instead of calling it like you would a function. And then we're going ahead and passing along that transformed value and we're emitting the value by calling observer.next. And then what you're doing here is you're also forwarding along the error and complete to the next observer. Um, so that, that's just very basic, just so you guys understand what is going on under the hood. But the re one of the reasons why I put this talk together is because there's over 60 operators in RxJS, right? And there's so many operators that allow you to do so many cool things. You probably won't ever have to implement one on your own. And today we're going to go through a few of those different operators. So we're going to go through flattening operators, error handling, completion, and then subjects and multicasting. So a lot of information. And this talk will be posted online, so you can re reference it back later. Uh, the three takeaways I'm going to give you for each operator are simply, number one, explanations you can actually understand. Uh, sometimes the technical explanation is a little bit more difficult, in my opinion, to understand. Also, the primary use cases of each operator I'm going to go through. And then the gotchas and the very common mistakes that we see when people are actually using these operators. So the three easiest operators in RxJS are map, filter, and scan, right? I'm going to um, skip map and filter because they're pretty basic. But I do want to talk about scan. So scan is actually a very powerful operator. Um, and a lot of people don't actually realize how powerful it is. But if we go ahead and explore it, what scan does is it simply applies a reducer function over the source observable. And then it'll return each intermediate result with an optional seed value. So primary uses would be managing state in a stream. For example, you could actually, if you're an Angular and you use NGRX, right, you actually don't have to use that. Um, you don't even have to use Redux if you're using 
uh, React, you can actually just use scan to create a Redux pattern in RxJS, which is kind of cool. So the way you would do that is just have a subject of actions to feed into a scan, which has your reducer, and then it'll just return an observable of state for you. So here you can actually see how scan works. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with marble diagrams. Sometimes I love them, sometimes I don't. But here, what you can do is you can see that we're starting off with an initial state of zero, and then we're applying a reducer function to scan and accumulating each value by v, right, which is the last value. Um, I had to spend probably about half an hour the first time I looked at marble diagrams to really understand what the heck was going on. So you love it or you don't, either way. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. So when people are using scan, a lot of common mistakes we see are people emitting the same reference multiple times, which can cause a lot of different problems. So if you're using scan as an operator, you should always treat your accumul uh, accumulated value as immutable. So that's scan. Um, Another very, very common category of operators that we see people get very confused about are flattening operators. So these would be the switch map, concat map, merge map, and exhaust map, and there's other maps. But how many of you all have gotten confused over which one to use before? Few folks, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, which one is it again? OK, so <laughs> let's just talk about switch map first. It's one of my favorites. Um, so switch map, what it does is map a value to a new observable, and then it subscribes to that observable, and then it'll unsubscribe from any previous observable it was subscribed to. So it's really important to note that switch map only subscribes to one observable at a time. And again, you, here you can see um, a diagram of what switch map is doing. And here you can see where u is the inner observable, and then i1 is unsubscribed, and the inner observable i2 is created and then subscribed to, right? So switch map, in a lot of ways, can actually be very confusing to people. Um, the primary use case is usually for HTTP GET. right? So if you're sending requests and getting info and you just want to get the latest thing and you don't care if it's canceled, then switch map is really great. It's also really great for autocompletes, like for example, if you're typing into a text box. Um, really good for toggling between two streams as well, like maybe you're toggling between button clicks on and off. This is actually one of the most common use cases for this operator. Um, it's also really great for animation because you can just wrap an animation in an observable. And then when you want to change the animation, the switch map is going to cancel the previous animation and then start with the new animation. So, we do see a lot of common mistakes in switch map, though. So if you are doing an HTTP post or a delete and a value is coming back that you actually care about, right? So imagine if you're sending two delete requests to a server and you care about both uh, the response of both deletes actually coming back. If you send the first one and then um, send a second request before the first is actually completed, then it's going to unsubscribe from the first one that's actually in flight. So in this case, you probably want to use something like concat map. So just remember, if the response from the data actually matters, then switch map is not the right one to use. So let's, let's go back, let's go to concat map next, since I just talked about it. Um, this is actually the most common operator for HTTP requests. This will actually ensure that everything happens in the order in which it arrived. So it'll take each value from the source and then map it into a new observable, just like switch map does, but then it keeps all your observables in a buffer and it only runs one at a time, end to end, until it completes before it moves on to the next observable in the buffer. So here's a great example of using concat map. All we're doing here is we're getting usernames from a GitHub API. And then I'm subscribing to the observable, and then it's going to output Lady Leap first, and then Ben Lush second, right? I don't know why there's that little thing there, but. So when you're using Comcat Map, you need to make sure that when you're using it, you actually have the observable end. So you should never be using concat map for toggling or endless streams, because if the stream never completes, then every subsequent concat map is just going to build up the buffer, and then the other observables in that that it's buffering are never actually going to run. So if you're only getting data and not posting it, then you should be using switch map instead of concat map. Um, or, you know, for example, if you don't care about the order, then you can use merge map instead of concat map. So hopefully that helps with some concat map. 
Merge map. Let's talk about merge map next. So merge map is probably the simplest flattening operator overall. So this is conceptually speaking, of course. But what, what it does is it takes every single value, it maps it into an observable, and then subscribes to it. It doesn't care about the order at all. And then it just outputs whatever is coming from those inner observables as a single stream of values. But again, it doesn't honor the order, right? So one of the great reasons to use merge map is if you want to send as many requests as possible and get as many responses as fast as possible, and you just don't care about the response order. So let's say you're building Twitter, for example, and you just want to have some likes fire, right? And you don't care about the order. Then merge map is going to be able to allow you to send likes as quickly as possible, because it's not going to fire the likes one at the time in order, like concat map. Um, and all you want to make sure, again, is that you have those likes as quickly as possible, right? Um, errors from requests as well is another example of when to use merge map. Um, in this case, if you have errors from requests, it's actually more useful to use merge map than switch map because if you want to know what errors come back from requests and be able to actually handle them, then this would be good. Because if you use switch map in this case, then the subscription would actually be canceled before the error comes back. So common mistakes. So one of the biggest common mistakes we see is when people are using merge map to map um, HTTP requests. And the reason why this is not good is because you don't know how long a server is going to take to respond, right? So if one request is slow and another is fast, then it's going to end up out of order. However, again, if you don't care about the order, then you can use this. So the last flattening operator I want to talk about is exhaust map. Um, and conceptually, this is just the opposite of switch map. So every time a value arrives, if you're not already subscribed to a previously mapped to observable, then exhaust map will map it into an observable and subscribe to that. So it's going to wait for the inner observable to complete or exhaust itself before it allows any new source values to be mapped to a new inner observable. Um, example uses. So exhaust map is really good if you want to prevent double submissions for example. So if you took a stream of button clicks and use exhaust map um, to map them into HTTP posts, then it only allows for one post at a time, waits for it to complete, and then every other time someone pushes the button, it's not going to do anything until that last request comes back successfully. Another great thing to use exhaust map for is touch drag features. So imagine if you're uh, you know, touching an item on a screen, right? If you're touching an item on a screen and you accidentally bump something with your other finger, you don't want the second touch to cancel your first movement, right? So exhaust map is going to be much better than, for example, switch map in this case, because with switch map, the second touch is going to make the other things start dragging. So a lot of people actually don't use exhaust map. <laughs> so we don't see a lot of really common mistakes yet. But one of the good things to remember is that you want to use exhaust map where you only want one request or one stream in flight, and you don't want any duplicate effort. So um, exhaust map is really useful if you don't care about having the latest observable, but you care just about starting one observable and waiting for it to be done before starting another. This is an example of exhaust map where we're running a finite timer for each click, but only if there's no current active timer, right? So error handling. Error handling is one of the biggest things in RxJS. We hear about it all the time. There's always things that could be improved. Um, I think with error handling, one of the most important things to remember is that if there's er any error at any point in your observable chain, then anything upstream dies and can't actually travel down, right? So I saved time for a little joke here. Um, <laughs> so two halves of a map to the Vegas Strip, what, which operator to, do you use? <laughs> this is actually a really bad joke. <laughs> the answer is merge map. It's funnier that it was terrible. <laughs> Anyway, so errors. OK, so anyways, let's talk about errors again. <laughs> so the way to stop the fact that basically you know, anything dies upstream is to make sure that there's some sort of error handling operator, right? Because it's going to prevent that. So the three error handling operators I want to talk about today are catch error, retry, and retry when. Um, let's talk about catch error first. So catch error does exactly what it sounds like. What it's going to do is it's going to catch errors on the observable to be handled by returning a new observable or throwing an error. 
So there's three different signals in ArcGIS, next error and complete, right? Error comes up when the observable stream ends with a problem. So when there's an error signal, people can just use catch error, for example. So when catch error actually gets an error, it's going to map that error into a new observable and then replace the original source observable that just erred with the new one. So you can look at a marble diagram again um, and see how catch error works. So again, what it does is when it gets an error, it's going to map that error into a new observable and replace the original source observable with a new one. Um, a really simple use case, so let's say we have an observable that just errors immediately when we subscribe to it. No values are ever emitted, it just errors, right? Um, catch error is very much like a single use merge map for errors, but instead of listening for values, it actually listens for errors. And then when it receives any new error, you know, it, it'll map into the new observable, and then that's what you actually end up subscribing to as a replacement. Um, the next error handling operator is retry. So retry is simply this. So if your observable errors, it's going to resubscribe to that observable a specific number of times, and you specify that specific number of times. It's really good if you're using it in the case of an HTTP request or a WebSocket stream where there's network flakiness, for example, because retry is basically going to do exactly the same thing as catch error. It'll listen to the error channel, but then when it gets an error signal, it's going to resubscribe to the original source. So if you're using a subject or a stateful observable, it's not going to reset the state of that observable, it's just going to resubscribe to it. Um, here's a simple use of retry, and here you can see that we're just uh, saying that when there's an error, we're using the retry, error, uh, retry operator to retry it only two times if an error is thrown, right? Right there, retry. <laughs> So a really big common mistake that we see when people are using the retry operator is not having an argument specified, right? Um, so always make sure when you're using retry, you're using it with an argument. Because if you call retry with no arguments, then no errors can actually come after it. And it's just going to keep retrying over and over and over and over again. Another really common mistake that we see with retry is using retry on hot observables. So example, if you're retrying a subject, it wouldn't really work the way most people um, suspect. So let's say you're saying retry three on a subject, right? It's going to subscribe to the subject three times and then just emit the error. So retry is actually best used for cold observables or any observable that create, it creates its own data source. Um, retry when is another one. So retry when is really great to use when you want more control uh, than just retry. Because what it'll do is it'll actually give you an observable of errors that you can map into an observable of notifications of when you want to retry. So this operator actually gives you total control over when and why you want to retry your observable. So you could use it if you want to set up a retry for when somebody's network connection is disrupted and maybe they come back online. Uh, a great example would be using retry with a delay, like an incremental step back, for example, on network failure. Um, so if you send a network request and it fails, you could say, wait two seconds, try again. If it fails, wait four, try again, wait eight, try again, et cetera. Um, here you can see it again used in the, co in, in the code. We're basically saying use retry when after an interval of six seconds. Okay, another bad joke. This one's better. What do you call it when a plane reacts to a bumpy landing? Anybody? It's debounce. I thought it was a little better. I think you guys disagree with me. <laughs> so anyways, I hope, I hope you enjoyed the error handling operators. But let's move on to completion operators. So the reason why these are called completion operators is because they always force completion. So we'll talk through four of them. We'll talk about take, take until, take while, and first. Um, let's talk about take first. <laughs> so take basically takes a certain count of values and then completes it for you. So an example is I can say take three. If I say take three, then the resulting observable is going to be an observable of three values from that source, and then uh, it'll, it'll complete, right? So primary use cases would be for when you want the first n values from the source observable, for example. And here you can see it again. Here we're just saying 
uh, take the first five values from interval count and then log it log out the first five values from the source observable. Um, Am I missing slides there? No, maybe I'm not. Um, so take and tell. So take and tell, what take and tell does is it uses the notifier observable to tell a source observable to complete, right? So as soon as that notifier observable emits one value, then it'll complete the source observable. So usually you're going to use this uh, over take or take while. You typically use take and tell. Um, because what the others do is they actually rely on the source observable to give you a value to complete. Whereas take and tell, for example, it'll allow you to use an outside notifier. So you can say take and tell five seconds or take and tell a button click. Um, Take and tell gets used the most for declarative subscription management. So you can use this to compose the unsubscribe, for example. Um, one thing that you want to make sure you don't do when using take and tell is providing the source observable with a notifier that never emits or completes. Like this is a very common mistake that we see in ArcGIS code. Take while is another completion operator. And what this does is it emits the source of uh, it emits Sorry. <laughs> it emits values emitted by the source observable as long as each value satisfies a given predicate. So, um, and then it'll just complete as soon as that predicate is actually satisfied. So you can say take while the function returns true, for example. Um, and it'll assert that the function is true over and over and over again. And then the minute it's not, it'll just complete for you. So here we're saying take while the value is greater than 200. And then when it's not, then the observable completes. Um, so sometimes people want to include the value that doesn't match a given predicate. So we have a new feature in RxJS. It was uh, introduced in 6.4, um, which is called take while inclusive. So what we can now do is add a second argument to take while called true, and it'll emit the last value that is not true before it actually completes, which is nice. Um, primary uses for take while. So um, a lot of times people use this uh, for mouse movements. So say you want to drag something, but it's only allowed to go halfway down a page. Or maybe um, a progress bar. So maybe you want to hide the progress bar um, if it gets over 95% because it'll be ready soon. One common mistake we see is not realizing that take while actually has to wait for a value to arrive before it completes and using it when you actually wanted to use, um, using it when you actually wanted the observable to complete after an event. So in this scenario, you should have used take and tell. And uh, the last one, ironically, is first. So first, what first does, it emits only the first value or the first value that meets some specific condition, right? Emitted by the source uh, observable or by a default value. If there's no default value provided, then it's going to error if it doesn't get the first value. Uh, primary use cases would be using it when you want to get the very next value, for example, from a WebSocket or, to, um, or from an update interval, for example. So, here you can see, basically, um, first is going to emit, uh, first will emit the first click that happens on a div. And some of these, uh, I'll, I'll share these slides, but some of these are also in the documentation. So one common mistake that we see is simply that people don't realize that first will actually error if it never finds a first value or doesn't have a default value. So it's really important to uh, make sure to provide a default value. So the last kind of area I want to talk about is subjects and multicasting. Um, I'll talk about the most important ones today, which are subject behavior, subject share, and share replay. Uh, subject, so a lot of people use subject. And I feel like a lot of beginners especially use subject because it's one of the first things in ArcGIS they understand, right? Um, subject is basically an observable that's also an observer. So this is primarily used for multicasting in RxJS, but another primary use case is getting an observable out of user events, like button clicks, for example. So common mistakes are basically just using subject too much because, uh, you know, don't just use subject if you don't know how to create an observable. So with subjects, what happens is you don't actually get guaranteed teardown or any memory management from it, which is what you would get from an observable. So when you make an observable, 
right? And uh, you provide it with a function. And the function is actually responsible for setting up what's producing the data and tying the observer to it, right? And that will actually also return a teardown function that gets called to teardown when it completes and errors or subscribes. But subject doesn't do any of that. Subject is just simply something you can next error and complete into. Right? And after a subject has errored or completed, it's actually no longer usable, whereas with observables, you can resubscribe to most of those observables. So it's much better to use observables um, instead of subject. So let's talk about behavior of subject. Um, behavior of subject is just a variant of subject. What it does is it requires an initial value and then emits its current value whenever it's subscribed to. So primary uses are maybe when you um, don't want a user or a system to wait until to wait to get the next value. So for example, maybe you want to give them whatever value, whatever last value you had. Uh, a good example might be a sensor. Um, if it gave a reading every two minutes, you wouldn't want the user who just, let's say, landed on your page um, to wait two minutes to get the first reading, right? You want to give them the immediate last value. And behavior subject, again, has the same gotchas as subject that I talked about. So on to multicasting, let's talk about share really quickly. What share does is share actually returns a new observable that multicasts or shares the original observable. So as long as there is at least one subscriber, this observable will be subscribed and emitting data, right? And when all subscribers have, sub have unsubscribed, then it'll unsubscribe from the source observable. And because the observable is multicasting, then it actually makes the stream hot. So primary uses would just be using share to make something multicast. Common mistakes. So unless your observables are synchronous, you should always be using share or share replay. And usually, you should be using share. Um, some people use publish or multicast, for example, but in, in most of those cases, they should actually be using share. And the reason is because under the hood, um, these all have just one instance of subject, right? So you can't retry if there is an error or something. But what share does is share actually automatically recycles the subject under the hood and allows you to resubscribe to the subject. So when it errors or completes, it's going to recycle and create a brand new instance so it's not completely dead. So share replay. So share replay is actually very similar to share. It's also one of my favorites. Um, the difference, though, is with share replay, it keeps the underlying replay play subject. So the next subscriber gets all the successful results and successful completion. And share replay actually also does ref counting under the hood. But it keeps a ref count of 1 to make sure that it can run to completion and ensure that the next subscriber gets the last cached value. So primary uses would just be maybe retrieving expensive data via HTTP. Maybe you don't want to get it twice. That's when you would use share replay. Um, common mistakes. So a lot of people don't realize that share replay actually uh, has a configuration object. So after the last subscriber unsubscribes, you can actually recycle, but it's not the default behavior, and that confuses a lot of people. Uh, also, you should always make sure that you have at least one argument passed into share replay, um, because share replay without an argument is going to cache every single value that it had nexted into and replays those to new subscribers. So that was a lot of operators. I actually shortened that because you can never get through all of them. Um, but those are the most important ones that you should think about. I think when people start learning RxJS and really understand it, they get overwhelmed with the number of operators. Um, but you know, I mean, there's really only 20 you need to have off the top of your head. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I put this talk together. So hopefully that helps. Um, in addition to that, um, ben, who wrote RxJS, <laughs> we spend a lot of time on the internet. So if you want to kind of go through this a little bit more, um, we have videos on our YouTube channel. So you can check that out. And we go like a lot deeper into the actual code of how something's made and uh, going to, through a lot of different examples as well. Um, another thing is, you know, with RxJS, we've been very happy because We've grown the team quite significantly in the past year. Um, but we're also always looking for new contributors. And it's a very welcoming community. Uh, we especially want you know, 
more underrepresented minorities to come help contribute um, and teach the community. So if you're interested, I'm always happy to chat and talk to you about it. And uh, besides that, you can see their pictures. But you know, Ben and I give this talk together, actually. So we both put this talk together. And then Michael Holadke, who uh, is based in Vienna, he does a lot of RxJS trainings. And um, he helped me put together the marble diagrams. So, and then if you want to check out more JavaScript, you know, development stuff, um, you can always check out this.media. We have a lot of amazing articles, talks on RxJS, Angular, Vue, React, et cetera. So thank you so much.